so my name is Sophie um, and I'd just like to thank the Natural History Society of Northumbria for asking me to give a talk today. Um, hopefully you all enjoy it. So I'll be talking about city living in the oceans, of who lives there and why. So coral reefs are my thing, um, but they're also sort of mini cities within the ocean. So coral reefs are really complex ecosystems that are supported by the base element of corals, but these corals support life in all different forms through algae, through fish, etc. And um, so they're really the base of everything and that's why they are so important. So we'll quickly have a little recap on what is a coral. So coral is actually an animal. So they grow in colonial forms. So there's multiple little polyps. So this here in the diagram is a polyp and they grow all together and they have a calcareous skeleton which over time will build up and up. When coral are stressed, they have um, a little algal symbiont. So they have algae that lives within their tentacles. And when they are stressed, they eject these, which is what makes the coral go white. So these are the two sort of main things to remember for our talk today is that when corals stress, they reject these, which makes them go white. And eventually, if they can retrieve these back to them, these little zooxanthellae, they will end up dying and leaving behind the skeleton that they grow, which is made of calcareous substrate. So I am particularly interested in corals in the Caribbean, or that's where I've done the majority of my research. So here on the screen we have Acropora palmata and Acropora cornus. So these are two of the Acropora species, which are the only Acropora species we find in the Caribbean. And they are sort of the keystone corals that build the structure of the coral reef. Um, in the past 40 so years, we've actually seen quite a decline in the amount of this coral on the reef. And this is due to various um, pressures such as overfishing, global warming and various diseases. Um, the main issue currently undergoing in the Caribbean is a distinct lack of herbivore species that live in the area, which would then remove the algal um, biomass from this area, which would allow the coral to grow stronger. But we're currently seeing a disease that wiped out the sea urchins also in the 80s, as well as overfishing of commercial species such as the blue tang and various parrot fishes. So these declines in these animals have meant that there's been a large amount of algae that has been able to grow on the reef, um, meaning that there's less space for the coral as well as the coral diseases. So the balance has been that we've seen a shift from sort of coral-based reefs to more algal-based reefs um, and seen an overall decline in the actual reef structure. So the main component of this talk is about the structural complexity. Now that we've seen who's building the reef, who benefits from the reef, we're now looking at what is the complexity of the reef. So the word complex, just for a little overview of the definition, it just means that it involves a lot of different but related parts. So a coral itself can be complex as well as the whole reef can be complex. So corals have different types of complexity. And um, so I will just swing my little thing down there if you can see that. Um, so here we have six different morphologies of coral. So coral morphology is basically the shape that the coral will take on. We have free living ones, such as these mushroom corals, plate-like corals that form quite a solid plate out the way, branching corals, which we would consider to be quite highly complex because they have a lot of different parts branching off in different directions. A folios or, um, Sorry, I can't remember the other name, but foliar style coral, which can contribute to complexity quite nicely by providing lots of small niches inside. We have mound, mounding corals or boulder corals, which are quite large ones, um, but the surface area of them is quite smooth overall, as well as sort of more plate-like or encrusting species. So of these, I would say that um, the branching and the foliars are the more complex, followed by probably the plate-like and the sort of more encrusting one with the lips and the small bits underneath it, then followed by a bolder one, and then these free living ones that don't offer a significant amount of structure. Um, so 
Complexity is basically the study of the structure of corals individually and on the reef. Okay, so what do we actually measure when we're measuring for complexity and how do we measure it? So here we have a few pictures of me in action. Um, so measuring complexity is a lot of fun as well as a lot of equipment. <laughs> so in this first image, we've got me doing a rugosity index measure. So rugosity is basically the definition of rugose is how wrinkly it is. <laughs> so basically how wrinkly is the reef? What we do for that is we would place down this chain and you would lie over the substrate of the reef and it would contour all the different coral. And from there, you would measure it with a tape and you would divide it to get a rugosity index, which would basically tell you how complex that piece of the reef is. Another method to do is what my friend here at the back is doing is a habitat assessment score whereby you would look at the different um, growth forms and various things. We'll talk through this in a little bit more detail in the future, but basically come with a visual appraisal of what the complexity of your reef is. Another fun method that has been more recently developed um, and that I got to try out in 2017 is a structure from motion photogrammetry, which is basically making a 3D model from videos of the coral reef, which you can then measure different metrics of complexity in a more digital format. So that would be me here with my GoPro with, it has three cameras on it um, to measure this. So those are sort of a few of the ways to do it. Why do we measure it? We measure it to look at its interactions and things like this in with the other organisms that live on the reef. So this big camera was actually to measure fish biomass as well. Um, so the current methods that are most commonly used, or at least historically more commonly used, are the chain method or tape and chain and a habitat assessment score. So we'll just talk about the tape and chain and sort of how we would go about measuring this. So we would lay in a two by two meter quadrat, for example, a two meter long chain. I would, to cover a large section of it, cover three, um, chains in each direction, as you can see here, to get a total of six chains and get the average of this. So you've got the average of the area. Um, so that's quite a simple method. You just place it over, you drape it over gently, making sure it follows all the contours as best as you can. And then you measure it for this rugosity index. The habitat assessment score is a little more complex. So it's basically assigning a score to the reef. As you can see, a score from one to five, based on how squiggly, how wrinkly is the reef, um, which is its rugosity. How many growth forms are there? Are there lots of sponges? Is it different corals? Is there algae? Um, anything that's basically um, alive. And what shape are they taking? Are they branching? Are they massive? Are they plate-like? So referring back to those images that we saw of the different coral and its complexity. What sort of height are these? Are they zero to nine centimeters? Are they over 80? Are they really tall, really small? How many refuges have they got in them? So this is important, especially if you're looking into like more organisms that are living there. Do they have um, lots of little ones or do they have lots of big ones? What's the percentage of live cover of the reef? So that is anything that is living. So anything, sponges, algae, anything alive, um, no matter what its shape is, and how much of your quadrat is filled with this, um, as well as the amount of hard substrate available, um, either for now or for in the future for things to attach themselves to. So the habitat assessment score is quite interesting um, because it can be used on various um, habitat types. So it's not just used for coral reefs as is the tape and chain, but it can be really scaled from sort of small 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter quadrats if you really want to really large 10 kilometers by 10 kilometer areas. So it's quite a versatile method. Um, I've had a tendency to use it on sort of two by two meter quadrats usually. So these, wing me up to the corner again. Um, so these methods do have sort of fundamental flaws to them, I suppose in the fact that the chain method would lack a lot of precision. So it varies from study to study, what actual chain you use, what size of the links on it. But not only that, it's governed by gravity. And so it doesn't actually always follow the full contour of the reef. 
if your coral goes up and round and down, your chain's just going to fall straight down flat. Um, so it doesn't give you the true measure of the contour of the reef. Not only that, but we do tend to advocate for not touching, <laughs> just look and don't touch. Um, so the fact that you're physically placing it on the coral can stress the coral and it can damage the reef further. Um, however, it is low cost and it is quite time efficient and it doesn't take up much space. So it's easy to fit in your dive pockets or anything like that. So it's good, but it doesn't give you a full overview of the reef. Because as we saw, we had to place six different ones to get a rough estimate of it. We're not looking at the reef as a whole. The habitat assessment score also has a few caveats. It is quite user biased. Um, although studies are being done to take a look at, does it actually, is it as biased as we think it is, or if lots of users are producing similar outcomes. Um, this method is quite dime efficient and it is very low damage to the coral as you're not touching it in any shape or form. It's also low cost, all you need is the criteria to do it. Um, and it provides a full overview of the reef that you're looking at, including quite importantly, live cover of the reef, which is really of interest um, for a lot of studies. Because it's all very well saying, oh yes, I have a very complex piece of reef, but if it's all dead, it might not actually be that interesting. So the more modern method that we've got going is a 3D modeling method. So it's pretty cool. Um, I've been really lucky to use this. And um, so what we do is we actually use some GoPros and film the reef or the area of reef. So if you were doing a two by two meter quadrat, which was the initial study that I did, you would do it in a lawnmower fashion up and down, you'd film your quadrat or in the later studies that I've done where you saw me with the GoPro stick with the three GoPros on it, we can actually assess a 50 by two meters of reef doing this. So basically what happens is you film it and then you upload it onto various softwares that will form the 3D model for you. And from there, you'll be able to measure three different metrics of complexity, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, so it's pretty cool because it's really quick to use in the field. It's very precise and there's no user bias towards it. You filmed the area, you filmed the area. You're putting no personal input into it. The equipment, although having a cost associated with it isn't extortionate in the realms of science. A lot of people now, a lot of recreational divers have GoPros and so this is quite accessible to a lot of people. The main disadvantage is the equipment that you need on the dry land afterwards to process it. Um, it's not the most time efficient. It does take quite a lot of computer processing power to do. Although assuming over time, this will get better as it's still quite a new method, um, but it does only function efficiently at the moment still on certain substrate types. So hard coral reef is perfect for it because they don't move, they don't waft around in the surge. Um, but if you were to do more of a sponge-based reef or a reef with a lot of sea fans, you might encounter quite a few problems with that. Um, so what does it actually measure? So with the 3D modeling method, as you can see here, it's actually filmed in this zone of the reef here, whereby you can see the quadrat that was placed down that was again like the other ones above, two by two meters. From that, you can place a 3D tape and chain across it, which will also give you six rugosity outcomes. But as we can see from the little shapes here, that it actually really does contour the reef in a way that the physical tape and chain doesn't. The other one that we've got is vector dispersion, which I will talk about a little bit more, but it's basically the angles of um, the contour of the reef, as well as fractal dimension, which is a mathematical measurement of fractals, which can be done at different scales. So vector dispersion is basically, it estimates the variance in between all the vectors and so it places a grid over the piece of reef that you've got, a physical, like a computer grid. You're not physically placing on the reef. It does it when you're back in the dry lab, um, which puts points that are placed one centimeter apart and it measures basically the angles between these, which can give you a measure of rugosity as well. Um, and then fractal dimension, as you can see here, I think the best way to explain it um, at the different scales is by this cock snowflake, which 
shows how at different scales you can the complexity changes. So you can start a snowflake's basic structure is a big triangle, but with each time that you zoom in on it a little bit more, you realize more complexity. So suddenly it goes to like a big star and then it's got more stars on it and then more stars on it and then more and more and more until you get the really fine detail of your snowflake. So that's a little bit what we're looking at here in the top whereby if you look at it on a big scale, so a 60 centimeter scale, it's sort of four big squares. If you look at it on the 30 centimeter scale, it suddenly becomes a little bit more complex until you get down to one centimeter where we're looking at pretty much similar to what the original is, which is an unlimited scale. Um, so yeah, this one's really interesting when looking at relating your substrate or your structural complexity to the organisms that are on it as um, it highlights a lot, like the Habitat Assessment Score did, the different niches that the organisms can live in. Um, so I suppose the real question about this is why is the structural complexity really important? Um, so with the current trends of the climate change that we're seeing, we're going to be expecting a lot more of the images below whereby a lot of coral have been diseased through bleaching, through ocean acidification, we will be moving to a phase shift of reef flattening and most likely algal dominated reefs. Um, so through this, it means that the coral aren't growing and therefore they're not building that um, calcareous skeleton that we saw on one of those first slides that really contributes to building up the reef. Without this structure, we are going to see quite a lot of devastating impacts. Um, the first one being there is a distinct lack of coastal protection. So reefs really attenuate a large amount of wave energy during storms, during surges, um, during big hurricanes and really protect the land from a lot of potential flooding. Not only this, but the complexity, as I've mentioned a few times, is quite related to organisms and Therefore, it provides a lot of niches, a lot of habitats, a lot of refuge for fishes. Um, their predators and prey interactions would then be affected if the prey cannot hide in the coral because there's no more coral to hide in. Not only this, it's also a resource of food for a lot of fish. Um, it would have great impacts on tourism, as I don't know about you, but I'm a diver and I would much prefer to go see reefs at the top than the reefs down the bottom. Um, Reefs also have a large role that is still undergoing quite a lot of exciting new research on blue carbon sequestration, so whereby they act as a similar role to, say, a forest would in trapping the carbon and keeping it locked inside them. Um, so this, this complexity is really important to sustain a lot of life within the reefs, um, especially going forward. The fact that our coral might not be able to keep growing its skeleton due to ocean acidification causes a lot of concern for a lot of people. So understanding how the complexity of the reef influences all these various factors such as our protection, such as our fisheries, will influence a lot of our management around how we protect coral reefs and how we look at restoring them in the future. Um, is it the species of coral that's interesting? Is it the structure itself? and sort of decoupling things to understand individual elements of complexity is really interesting and it's something that I find really fascinating and hopefully get to continue in. Um, so thank you very much for watching the talk, I appreciate that. Um, if you've got any questions, if you want to pop them in the comments below or you can send me an email at sophie.callan1 at newcastle.ac.uk I'll do my best to answer them and um, hopefully you've enjoyed that and yeah, have a nice evening.